Chapter 13, The Ocean Floor. The vast world ocean. Earth is often referred to as the blue planet. 71% of Earth's surface is represented by oceans and marginal seas. Continents and islands comprise the remaining 29%. The northern hemisphere is called the land hemisphere, and the southern hemisphere is the water hemisphere. And from this picture you can see why. Most of the land is located in the northern hemisphere. Where the southern hemisphere, it's mostly ocean. There are four main ocean basins. The Pacific Ocean is the largest and has the greatest depth. The Atlantic Ocean is about half the size of the Pacific and not quite as deep. The Indian Ocean is slightly smaller than the Atlantic and it's largely in the southern hemisphere. And then the Arctic Ocean is about 7% of the size of the Pacific. And from this map we see that the Pacific Ocean is here, the Atlantic is here, Indian Ocean, Southern Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean. Mapping the ocean floor. Bathymetry. Measure bathymetry is a measurement of ocean depths and the charting of the shape or topography of the ocean floor. An echo sounder, which is also referred to as sonar, was invented in the 1920s. It's the primary instrument for measuring depth. It reflects sound from the ocean floor. So there's an echo sounder and multi-beam sonar. So as echo sounder, a pulse is sent down, hits the ground, and it reflects and comes back. And they time how long it takes for the sound to travel. And since we know the speed of sound, we can calculate how far it is from the ship to the floor of the ocean. With multi-beam sonar, they can, they can uh, send out a whole swath of sonar beams and measure a whole swath as they travel. They can also hold, um, carry a sight scan towfish to also uh, send out sonar signals for more rapid bathymetry mapping. So again, that multi-beam sonar employs an array of sound sources and listening devices, obtains a profile of a narrow strip of sea floor, measuring the shape of the ocean surface. We can also measure the shape of the ocean surface from space. Okay. So here we use a satellite and we send out um, radar, this radar altimeter, so outgoing radar pulses, and then we get incoming uh, return pulses from the sea surface and this actually maps the surface of the ocean. The surface of the ocean isn't all flat. It tends to replicate or mimic what's going on at the ocean floor. Here's a shaded relief map showing shaded bathymetry. So as you go down you can see the slope and you go down deeper bathymetry. The lines just like uh, topo contour lines, each line is a line of a particular elevation. And the closer the lines are together, the steeper the surface is. And here we actually can see some of the features of the coast that we'll be talking about in a little bit. But here we have the continental shelf, this nice flat area. And then and the slope coming off the shelf is the continental slope. Then we have a little area that's slope, but much shallower slope. It's the continental rise. There are three major topographic units of the ocean floor, the continental margins, the ocean basin floor, and the mid-ocean ridge. So these major topographic divisions north of the North Atlantic Ocean, we mapped from A to B, nice profile, and here we mapped out the elevations, or bathymetry, from A to B. We'll see we have a continental margin near the two continents, so right near the two continents, the continental margin. Then we have deep ocean basin, okay? So we have deep ocean basin and deep ocean basin. And in the middle we have this mid-ocean ridge, this mountainous terrain underwater. Now continental margins, there are both passive and active continental margins. So passive ones are found along most coastal areas that surround the Atlantic Ocean. These are not associated plate boundaries, experience very little volcanism, and few earthquakes. The features we find are the continental shelf. It's a flooded extension of the continent, varies greatly in width, it's gently sloping, and contains oil and, and important mineral deposits. Some areas are mantled by extensive glacial deposits. Most consi consist of thick accumulations of shallow water sediments. The continental slope marks the seaward edge of the continental shelf, relatively steep structure, boundary between continental crust and oceanic crust. 
Submarine canyons and turbidity currents can be found there. Submarine canyons are deep, steep-sided valleys cut into continental slope. Some are the seaward extension of river valleys. Most appear to have been eroded by turbidity currents. The turbidity currents are downslope movement of dense, sediment-laden water that flows down these submarine canon canyons, and the deposits that are left behind are tur turbidites. So turbidity currents, so we see here we have our continental slope here, and, and here are these submarine canyons. And these turbidity currents, when they flow down the canyon, bring a lot of sediment and drop them just off the edge of the shelf there on the continental rise in fan shapes called deep sea fans. This reminds you a little bit of alluvial fans from our desert chapter. Okay, the fine particles will settle out first and then the coarse pot of particles will have graded beds of material. The continental rise is found in regions where, trenches, where there's no trench. The continental slope merges into a more gradual incline of the continental rise. and There's a thick accumulation of sediment at the base of the continental slope, turbidity currents that follow submarine canes deposit sediment that forms deep sea fans. Okay, so here's another diagram of passive continental margin. There's no plate boundary here or deep sea trench. So we have our continental shelf, our submarine canyons. We have our deep sea fans on our continental, well here's a continental slope, then our continental rise that kind of peters out to the abyssal plain, which is part of the deep ocean basin. Active continental margins, this is where we have a plate boundary. So they're located primarily around the Pacific Ocean. The continental slope descends abruptly into a deep ocean trench. Accumulations of deformed sediment and scraps of ocean crust form accretionary wedges. Some subduction zones have little or no accumulation of sediments. Deep ocean trenches are long, relatively narrow features, deepest parts of the ocean. Most are located in the Pacific Ocean. Sites where moving lithospheric plates plunge into the mantle, associated with volcanic activity. This is this helps form volcanic island arcs and continental volcanic arcs. So here we have our active continental margin. We have an ocean plate subducting under a continental plate, forming a very deep ocean trench. There's a creationary wedge of deformed sediments are being deposited here. Okay. And the abyssal plain. Now we're going to talk about the features of the ocean basin floor. And the first one is the abyssal plain, likely the most level place on Earth. Sites of thick accumulations of sediment found in all oceans. On the abyssal plain, we'll find seamounts and guyots. Isolated volcanic peaks mainly form near oceanic ridges. Seamounts and guyots may emerge as an island. They may sink and form flat top seamounts called guyots or table mounts. Okay. So if it merges as an island, then later, you know, then the tip gets eroded down, so it gets flattened. Then when it sinks, it's a flat top sea mount called guyot or table mount. Okay. Mid-ocean ridge is characterized by an elevated position, extensive faulting, numerous volcanic structures that have developed on newly formed crust. Interconnected ridge system is the longest topographic feature on the Earth's surface. That's a, the mid-ocean ridge, over 70,000 kilometers in length, 23% of Earth's surface, winds through all major oceans. So along the axis of some segments are deep, down-faulted structures called rift valleys. This consists of layer upon layer of basaltic rock that have been faulted and uplifted. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge has been studied more thoroughly than any other ridge system. Okay, so our oceanic ridge system, okay, here's, here's a Mid-Atlantic Ridge here. Basically, it winds all around, around the Earth, and it's named for the region each portion is in. So here's the Mid-Indian Ridge, Southwest Indian Ridge, Southeast Indian Ridge, Antarctic Ridge, the East Pacific Rise. Okay. It's the longest linear feature on Earth. Seafloor sediments. Okay, the ocean floor is mantled with sediment. The sources are turbidity currents and sediment that slowly settles to the bottom from above. The thickness varies. The thickness, thickness in trenches. Accumulations may approach up to 10 kilometers deep. They're thick. The Pacific Ocean, about 600 meters or less. The Atlantic Ocean, about 500 to 1,000 meters thick of sediments. Mud is the most common sediment on the deep ocean floor. 
Of the sediments, the terrigenous sediments, are materials weathered from continental rocks. Virtually every part of the ocean receives some. Fine particles remain suspended for a long time, and oxidation often produces red and brown colored sediments. There's also biogenous sediments, shells and skeletons of marine animals and plants. Most common are the calcareous oozes produced from microscopic organisms that inhibit and inhabit warm surface waters. Siliceous oozes composed of skeletons, diatoms, and radiolarians. Phosphate-rich materials derived from bones, teeth, and scales of fish and other marine organisms are all biogenous sediments. Hydrogenous sediments, minerals that crystallize directly from seawater. The most common types include manganese nodules, calcium carbonates, metal sulfides, and evaporites. Okay, the dis distribution of these sediments, the coarse pterogenous deposits dominate continental margin areas. Fine-grained pterogenous material is common in deeper areas of the ocean basin. Hydrogenous sediments comprise only a small portion of deposits in the ocean. There are a few places where very little sediment accumulates like the mid-ocean ridges. Resources we get from the seafloor. Energy resources, we get oil and gas and gas hydrates. Other resources are sand and gravel, evaporative salts, and manganese nodules. End of that chapter.